legend, a genre of folklore that consists of a narrative featuring human actions, believed or perceived to have taken place in human history. Narratives in this genre may demonstrate human values and possess certain qualities that give the tale verisimilitude. Legend, for its active and passive participants, may include miracles. Legends may be transformed over time to keep them fresh and vital. Ever since 1987, The Legend of Zelda has continued to redefine the world over and over again. With The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, or countless others, it's quite apparent that one thing has remained consistent throughout time, despite the world going through wars, pandemics, and depressions. A playable twink. In 2017, the franchise would get a new mainline entry that changed everything, and that game would be Breath of the Wild. Its impact on the series and on the gaming industry as a whole can never be understated. For most of my childhood, I was a casual gamer. I had a Wii, or rather a Wii U with only Wii games, and the only games I had played were Twilight Princess, Wii Sports, Kirby's Epic Yarn, and Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock. Because every kid needs to go through their musical phase. But it wasn't until Christmas of 2018 when that all changed. I remember that for a huge gift, that me and my siblings got Nintendo's newest console at the time. And no, not the new Nintendo 2DS XL, something better the Nintendo Switch. And alongside those games were Just Dance 2017, Super Mario Odyssey, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Minecraft, and most importantly, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This made me a proper Nintendo fan. This introduced me to how good games could truly really be. This introduced me to how I could bitch online about Nintendo games online and gather friends to talk about it. Whether or not the Lost Bar is a good thing is something that you can decide for yourself. Either way, Breath of the Wild is such an incredible game with such an incredible legacy. With a fire in Super Smash Bros, a spin-off called Age of Calamity in 2020, and a direct sequel with Tears of the Kingdom. It has never been a better time to be a Zelda fan. And hey, if you're interested, I released a compilation of my three Tears of the Kingdom videos not too long ago, so check that video out when you're done with this one. I love and adore Tears of the Kingdom so much, and I love it a lot more than Breath of the Wild due to everything that had changed or adjusted. It improved upon the foundations of what Breath of the Wild had created, and then more. It has a story so bad that it feels like I wrote it, which isn't a good thing at all. But Breath of the Wild is a masterpiece in every sense of the word, and you can just feel it just by starting the game, the combat, the music, the experience. Tears of the Kingdom may have improved upon it a lot, but there's still an amazing base here. This isn't a Shin Megami Tensei 5 situation where the original was good but lacked a lot of potential. Breath of the Wild is just worthless. Breath of the Wild has some issues, but overall it's still a fantastic game with an underrated story and a beautiful world that still shines on even without everything that Tears of the Kingdom added and improved on. The first time coming out of the Shrine of Resurrection to see this Hyrule is an experience we will never get to see again. There's a sense of isolation in Hyrule that I adore and don't get to see a lot in the franchise. Breath of the Wild is a perfect game as a launch title for the Switch and as a last major release for a rotten piece of mold. This game is just so special to me and I love it. And I also needed help from a 7 year old to figure out how to get to the first 4 shrines. It's embarrassing. In my defense, it was because of constipation, and also just being bad at the game. One of Breath of the Wild's main selling points was that you could climb anything anywhere. And to this day, I've never seen or played another game that isn't Tears of the Kingdom that's like Breath of the Wild in any way or feels this real. Getting to climb anything and go anywhere you want to is great and helps with the sense of exploration that the game tries to throw at you. And to me, it makes the game feel real, if that makes any sense. There's a lot to do in Hyrule. And, of course, the main objective after leaving the Great Plateau is to defeat Calamity Ganon all the way in Hyrule Castle. Though, if you go in there blind and with nothing, it's like seeing a cockroach getting smushed by a boot. It ain't pretty, just to say the least. So to help Link not be smushed by Calamity again, first you need to know what Link's moveset is like in Breath of the Wild and how different it is compared to the previous games in the series. Let's start with the Stamina Meter, or rather, the Stamina Wheel. We first saw this in Skyward Sword, but it's been tweaked a bit. First of all, it doesn't look like a lime anymore, and second of all, you can expand it. Expand it, you may ask? That's if you haven't played the game, but in reality, most of the people here watching the video have already played the game, so this video is just kinda useless and late. In all seriousness, stamina is a necessary feature. Being able to climb anywhere with no limits isn't really a good thing for game design, unless if you're cheating, which you do you. 
I like salmon a lot because it helps to make the game feel more realistic. I remember that in both of my playthroughs of Breath of the Wild and also in Tears of the Kingdom, for a good majority of those games, I only focused on stamina because stamina is really important. This was also because I wanted to be able to climb things for a good amount of time, but also because I wanted to run away from these fucking creepy things. And next we have Shield Surf, which is a small but a really nice change and something that I hope to see return in future entries. Shield Surfing helps a lot with traversal, especially in snowy and sandy areas of the map where you can't bring a horse. It's also just a very fun mechanic to use and abuse. I remember just loving Shield Surfing whenever I could, especially with the minigame in the Hebrew Mountains. These next few features are all technically different, but all lead to the same outcome, so I'll lump them together. A neat part about Breath of the Wild's combat system is that the game makes you feel powerful as hell, even at the beginning of the game. So see, whenever you dodge, you slow down time, and then after that, you get to use a mechanic known as a flurry rush. This lets you attack a lot in a short amount of time. It's something that you won't always be able to do on your first try, but damn, it feels really satisfying. And then, we're here at the most controversial part about Breath of the Wild's combat. Weapon breaking. It is fair to be annoyed by this mechanic in some areas since, in my opinion, I think they took it too far in some areas. So see, after a while, a weapon, tool, or shield breaks with enough wear and tear, and that's okay. This encourages the player to explore more, so you get better weapons and better gear. This was never an issue for me, and I'm honestly surprised that this stuck around with the discussion of Breath of the Wild for so long. Instead, it's interesting and it helps to keep combat fresh. Overall, I like the combat here. It's simple, but complex enough to the point where I don't get sick of it. Though because Breath of the Wild is an open-air game where you can go anywhere you want, anytime, the game suffers from scaling difficulty in a way that feels satisfying. Like, the game is fun to break, but sometimes I want to be broken. So after a while, the gameplay loop stays the same. Get a strong weapon, defeat an enemy, and get stronger materials and weapons. And that leads to the game feeling too easy, which unfortunately carries on to the final boss. I will say though, I think it's a missed opportunity that Breath of the Wild, or especially Tears of the Kingdom, didn't add hidden skills from Twilight Princess. So see, throughout your adventure in Twilight Princess, there's this fox looking creature. By interacting with it, you would learn a powerful new skill. If it was in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, that would have been another incentive for exploring more in Hyrule. Alas, we can't have everything. With the more traditional Zelda games, they had a universal gameplay loop. Get a new item, go into a dungeon, access a new area, repeat and rinse. This isn't me dissing the loop because it's a good loop and a loop that I fully endorse. So, in the tradition to moving to an open air style where you can go anywhere you want and play through the story how you want to, traditional items had to be phased out. So instead of getting items throughout the game, and then you know the rest, it's a tale as old as time. You get to the four shrines, get four abilities, get the paraglider, get off the great plateau, and then, the game truly begins. Shika runes are interesting, and they also shouldn't be compared to traditional items. In something like Twilight Princess, for example, you would get an item, and the dungeon would be designed around that. That's cool, and that's a good thing. It makes the dungeon feel unique. Though, after you finish a dungeon, a lot of times, the item would just be forgotten. Like, what the fuck are you supposed to do with a Dominion Rod after the Temple of Time? Stick it up your ass. The Shika runes are the replacements for traditional items, and this time, they're used all around Hyrule for puzzles and I'll go over each one of them. Let's start with Magnesis, since I'm feeling a little adventurous today. Like the name indicates, this lets you pick up any metal like if it was a toothpick. This is more of a puzzle-focused rune, though you can use it for combat. It just happens to be the slow stamp thing and makes you look as cool as your grandma saying skippity toilet. Since there are two versions of remote bombs, I'll go with this one second. Remote bombs, or like the name suggests, it's a bomb that could be detonated anywhere. What a shocker! These aren't too powerful, so you shouldn't use them while fighting enemies. They do knock enemies back a bit, but it's not worth it since the damage isn't too good. Cryonis Cryonis is a very situational rune and just one that you don't really use a lot outside of shrines. Then there's Stasis, both interesting and one that I think has a little bit of missed potential. So first of all, it sucks at combat, do not use it for that. But on the other hand, oh my gosh, it's so cool in puzzles and with breaking the game. So with the right amount of momentum, you can make objects go flying, and it's just so cool to see what you're able to stop. I do think that Recall overall from Tears of the Kingdom is a cooler rune, because you can use it more, but Stasis, it ain't half bad. And it's also interesting to see how speedrunners use it to skip the Great Plateau. The Camera Rune is one of the few runes that you don't get on the Great Plateau. You get this one in Hitano Village from a little gremlin called Pira, the less hot version. Here, you get to do the greatest thing in any Zelda game. Take selfies. And also an encyclopedia that is strangely addicting to complete. I mean, look at it, it's practically free dopamine. And then there's the Master Cycle Zero. So, I don't have the expansion pass. Overall, the runes are pretty cool. And it's cool seeing a world and dungeons that now all revolve around you having all these tools guaranteed from the start of the game. I do think that they improved runes a lot more in Tears of the Kingdom. I mean, in Tears of the Kingdom, you can go up ceilings and scare the loving shit out of everyone. 
It's just a lot of fun. But this is a really solid base for something that I would love to see return in a future Zelda game in one way or another. Let's talk about them. I'll start with the best and most iconic one, Rivali's Gale. This lets you soar up incredibly high. It's kind of obvious why this is a good one since this is solely focused on the exploration side of Breath of the Wild. Reposus Fairy is next and this one is more focused on combat. You activate it by charging an attack as usual, but when you do it this time, you deal lightning damage in a given area. It's overpowered and makes the game easier than it needs to be, but damn do I love that. And then we have a more defensive ability with Druid's Protection. And it's just okay. It's like Little Caesars. If you get for free then of course you're gonna eat it. But on its own... And then there's Mifa's Grace, perfect when you die rolling down a hill, but then it doesn't matter because you still die in the end. Overall, Champion Billy's are cool additions, and then Tears of the Kingdom just makes these a lot worse. The potential there was good, but the end, just way too much. It makes the champion abilities in comparison better, and probably because of the simplicity. This, again, is why I love Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways compared to Tears of the Kingdom. Do you want to hear the coldest take of the year? Breath of the Wild is a great video game. Kidding aside, I want to bring up the translation of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, but that's not this video. Video game translation is a touchy subject, mostly because any who say a translation is bad have to be thrown in with the racist weebs who will unironically call you a baka and tell you to shine. So, what is so bad about Breath of the Wild's translation? Well, it's Link. Specifically, Link's diary. In the Japanese version of Breath of the Wild, Link kept a diary where Link actually wrote his thoughts down on every single quest you did. What did Nintendo replace it with? The adventure log. No diary, no Link thoughts, he is a fairy head empty, no thoughts boy, when translated. That's all. Matthew is out of here!